Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Again, wherever you're joining from us um, or joining us from, uh, we're glad to have you here with us live. Um, today, we will be going through a session. Uh, Vanessa Conlon will be leading us through understanding Napa Valley's top grapes and wine styles. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping notes. Uh, we do want to make sure that you all know this will be recorded and stored on YouTube. So if it's getting a little late, you can always hit pause and rejoin later. And of course, we do have a little bit of a longer session today. So if you have any questions or anything, there's that lovely Q&A box down there. Feel free to pop in your questions and then we will try to get to those at the end of the session today. Now, uh, without much further ado, I'll be introducing Vanessa. So I'll just give you a little bit of some notes on her before she goes away and, and tells us all about Napa. So Vanessa, thank you so much for being here. Um, real quick on her story and her background. So she has served as a director of sales and marketing for several wineries, um, top prestigious ones in Napa Valley. Uh, some names include Arietta Wines, uh, Dana Estates. She also did work on the other side of the coast, so the East Coast, um, in Manhattan for several uh, wine retailers and wine bars serving as the wine buyer and wine director for those. And, um, you know, she has a very wonderful heart and is very much an avid supporter of charitable causes. She sits on the board of the Jameson Humane Foundation, which is an animal rescue and sanctuary. And, through hard work, she has raised over $7 million with wine auctions that she has helped organize. So that is really impressive. Um, and just one <laughs> fun little tidbit about Vanessa is that in her previous life, uh, she was a professional musician performing on Broadway internationally. Uh, so that is really awesome. Maybe she'll she'll share some tunes with us during the session. We'll see. <laughs> um, but without much more to say. Um, welcome, Vanessa. The stage is yours. We are so happy to have you here with us, and we are looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And from everybody joining, um, joining, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. I have some slides to present. Um, I live in Napa Valley, so this is very dear to my heart, and I love sharing knowledge about Napa. So there is quite a bit to get through today. So. Um, do utilize the chat and the q a i will try my best to get to those questions but do forgive me if we run um long on this session because there is quite a bit to get through so um one moment i will share my screen and we will get started okay wonderful well again welcome thank you so much for being here um, we're excited to share uh, knowledge about Napa today. So what we're going to cover today, so this is a foundation course. We're gonna cover, um, I'm gonna cover a little bit of history. We're gonna talk about the place, um, some people who are very instrumental in putting Napa Valley on the map. And then we're definitely gonna cover the key grape varieties. So we're gonna cover their characteristics, wine making styles uh, and what you might how you might describe it to a consumer who wants to know more, but maybe has never had these types of wine from Napa Valley. So our learning objectives today, of course, is um, confidence uh, among all. Um, the goal is to arm you with knowledge about the characteristics and the differences of Napa Valley's key grape varieties and wine styles. So whether you already discuss grape varieties, you know, daily and, and uh, or you just are just getting started and wish to know more, um, you're definitely going to leave with some knowledge and some terminology that you can use. And in the end, uh, the goal is, of course, for you to be able to distinguish and compare and contrast the key characteristics of the grape varieties that we're going to cover in today's session. And then for those of you who work in the trade, again, be able to help a consumer uh, if they're new to it as well. So. Uh, before I dive into this um, this particular slide, I just wanted to give a, a, a brief overview of this, this special place of Napa Valley. So Napa as a as sort of a brand name is very famous, um, but it's actually quite a small region. It's only about 30 miles long and about five miles wide at its, at its widest. So um, in spite of being a very small region, it has quite a bit of notoriety. But in fact, only 4% of California's wine grapes actually come from Napa Valley. Uh, I'll discuss uh, the place a little bit more as we go, but it has 33 soil series 
and 100 soil variations. So it's very, very diverse in terms of soils, but also elevation and topography. So we have sea level all the way up to 2,600 feet in elevation. And one thing to know about the Napa Valley is the Napa, the whole of Napa Valley is what we call an ABA, which is an American viticultural area. But nestled within the Napa Valley ABA, there are 16 other approved American viticultural areas. So to start with a little history, so um, winemaking began here uh, back in the 1600s when Spanish missionaries, as you can see on the uh, on the slide here, um, they moved north from Mexico up the west coast and and then they planted what we know now as the mission group, which came from Spain. It's also known as Criolla or Pace. Um, but this became the mission grape became really the first original black grape variety uh, in California. So from 1769 to 1824, Franciscan monks established 21 missions in the area and planted the mission grapes for sacramental use um, for communion wine. And so mission was a very important variety in California until the spread of phylloxera. I'm sure you've all had heard of phylloxera, which really kind of devastated the vineyards uh, in many places in the world and also was present here in California. And it really wiped out almost all of the mission grapes except for about 600 acres that remain. And that's mainly in the Central Valley. So in 1861, this is really when the idea of having um, high quality wines here, of respected wines. Um, so Vitis vinifera, so foreign varieties uh, were planted here by some very famous uh, pioneers like George Belden is one. Um, and innovators such as a, someone named Jacob Schramm, uh, he joined this sort of spirited planting at the time and he chose Zinfandel as his top red. And I will definitely discuss Zinfandel as we move through the session. Gustav Niebaum, this is a very important man to know. Uh, he's one of the most famous pioneers of the Napa Valley. He was actually a Finnish fur trader, um, and, but he was instrumental in the advancement of quality within the Napa Valley. He was very wealthy, and as a result, he was, used to, he was able to use his wealth to import the best grape brines from Europe and to improve the quality of the winemaking here. And then in 1879, he established Inglenook which was the first Chateau style winery in all of the United States. And it was also the first to actually sell wine in bottles. Prior to that, it was actually sold in barrels, transported to the place of sale and bottled there. So today there are more than 35 grape varieties flourishing in Napa Valley, but only a handful, uh, five reds and two whites have greater than a thousand planted acres. But you can see we have quite a, a diverse variety of white and red varieties planted here. So there are several factors that make um, Napa Valley a, a high quality prime region for growing grapes. One is that we have a Mediterranean climate here. So this provides a long, dry, warm growing season um, during, the, during the growing season and into the harvest. And this is important for a number of varieties. One, it resists, um, it reduces the risk of, of vine diseases like mold and rot being affected like that. It promotes a healthy crop. It con contributes to the consistency of vintages year to year. We certainly do have vintage variation in Napa Valley, but it's oftentimes far less significant that you'll find in other regions. Um, when we look at places like Burgundy or Bordeaux, our vintages tend to be a little bit more um, consistent. And the Mediterranean climate also reduces the risk of swelled berries and sugar dilution from rain at harvest because we start harvest usually can start sometime in August here for us for white wine varieties. We make sparkling wine, which I'll talk about it a little bit later as well, um, and then continue all the way, you know, sometimes into into October, although with global warming, it's off, it's moving a little bit um, closer to um, uh, to summer these days. But because we don't really have rain during harvest, it does reduce that risk of, of dilution. So the rain comes in the dormant months uh, over the winter. It replenishes the groundwater and the reserves here. And this is important too, because this actually allows a lot of Napa Valley to dry farm. 
uh, or very tightly manage their irrigation practices. So what I mean by that, if you're not familiar with dry farming, is it means you're not going to use any artificial irrigation in the, in the vineyard yourself. You're just relying on natural rainfall. And it is not that uncommon here at all. Um, so the climate here drives the vineyards into dormancy over the winter. So the vine can store up its energy and reserves to use for the following growing season. And this long growing season is also ideal for wine grapes to ripen very slowly and evenly. And what this does is really allow the sugar and the acid to be in perfect balance and to allow phenolic ripeness. So um, something that happens here too that allows for this sort of beautiful balance of ripeness and acid is we have large diurnal shifts. So a diurnal shift is a shift in temperature from day to night, and here it can be quite significant. Um, so what this does is it allows the, the, the grapes to ripen during the daytime, and then because it cools down so significantly, it still allows the freshness and acidity to remain in the grapes. So we have that sort of perfect dichotomy of this California sunshine, but also beautiful freshness and, and vibrancy in the glass. That we're also influenced by the ocean here. So we have a, a proximity to the ocean and large bodies of water, um, they actually change temperature very slowly, more slowly than soil. And so we have less temperature variation overall. And the effects from the ocean mitigate the sometimes very high temperatures uh, that you can find here by delivering fog and cool breezes. And much of the valley's fog uh, comes up through the San Pablo Bay at the southern end of the region. So I'm sitting in the town of Napa, which is actually on the sort of more southern side of Napa. And I can tell you for sure, because I see it myself every day, that often you'll wake up, it, the whole um, part of the valley is blanketed in fog. And as the sun comes out over the course of the day, it begins to what we call burn off and you'll start to see, you'll start to see the sunshine. Um, this valley is also nestled between two mountain ranges. So on the western side, we have the Mayakamas Mountains. And on the eastern side, we have the Vaca Mountains. Um, so this, as I mentioned earlier, really allows for um, a lot of different elevations um, for plantings. And the higher elevations provide for the most diurnal swing. And that again, helps to retain acidity. Um, and higher elevations are also generally cooler uh, with more wind and rain, but with less fog. So these unique conditions provide for a variety of different flavors phenolic development at different altitudes and allow for greater complexity in the wines. And these two mountain ranges on either side, the Mayakamas and the Vaca, they have a, also a wide array of aspects or sun exposure. Um, so this can add uh, complexity to the wines if the grower, let's say, um, has vineyards with different aspects and then they blend it together uh, for more complexity. So, Mediterranean climate is actually very rare. Uh, only 2% of the Earth's surfaces have this, but it provides, again, as a recap, lots of sunshine, rain really only during the winter months, a very, very long growing season. And because of all of those things, we're blessed with very ripe and healthy fruit overall. All right, so let's talk through what we're going to cover today in terms of grape varieties, because I think this is what we're all most interested in, right, is what's in the glass and what, what can you expect to find there? I know it's my favorite part. Um, so we're going to cover two different white wine varieties, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay, and four reds. So we're going to talk through Pinot Noir, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Zinfandel. So just as a recap for um, anyone sort of new to wine, there are several places that the character of a wine in your glass can actually come from. So of course, starting in the vineyard uh, and with the actual grape variety itself. So I'm gonna talk through the different characteristics of those six different grape varieties, but a lot is just from the fruit and where it's planted. Um, another thing is of course the, the climate in the vineyard. I talked through those different sort of um, aspects and elevations here, the proximity to the bay, the proximity to the ocean. Those will all affect what happens in your glass when you taste it. And then of course there's the human element, which is the winemaking. And we're gonna talk through um, different, different winemaking techniques as well that you might find in a glass of, of wine from Napa Valley. All right, so as we said, each grape and then subsequently, of course, each wine has its own unique uh, character or personality um, that you can detect in the glass um, by aroma, color, body, 
acidity, flavor, and of course, texture. And when we talk through these red wines, we of course, we'll talk about tannin as part of that, that texture. All right, so flavor development. So over time uh, in the growing season, um, the, during the, the sugars begin to ripen. So you're gonna have um, more ripeness the later into the growing season as it develops more sugar accumulation in the grape variety itself. Of course, the time when the winemaker or the viticulturist chooses to pick is very important because again, they're looking for that balance of sugar accumulation, phenolic development, but also the acidity that's gonna provide freshness. So I would say probably the most important decision that someone can make the whole year is, is that day, when to pick. And then of course, at the end, it will be influenced by some winemaking techniques that we'll talk through. One of them might be something like oak, which is definitely something you can find in many of these examples from Napa Valley. So let's talk a little bit about um, climate and hang time. And what we mean by hang time is not we're hanging out, uh, it's how long the grapes are, the clusters are actually on the vine. And de depending on how long they are, it will definitely have a different effect on the wine in your glass. If you think about grapes ripening, you can liken this to any sort of fruit. If you have you know, a peach tree in your backyard, obviously if you pick that peach earlier, it's gonna be more tart there will be less sugar in it and it will have higher acidity. Um, if you pick it later, it's gonna have more sugar accumulation, the acid will start to fall. And then of course, if you pick very late, it's gonna be the most full bodied, riper, concentrated. Um, and in some cases here, if you look under cool climate um, or cool, there's this description of herbal and vegetal. And we'll talk through that a little bit, especially when we get into the Bordeaux varieties, because that is something that can, that can happen in your glass if it's grown in a cooler climate or let's say picked on the earlier side. All right, so the winemaking influence, um, we have a wide variety uh, as places around the world do of, of what we ferment and how we age wines. So we don't have any laws here in Napa Valley that govern how long we have to age a wine or what vessel it has to be aged in. So we actually have a lot of freedom here to express ourselves through our winemaking and in the glass. So you'll see a variety of different fermentation vessels here. Um, just certainly stainless steel, you'll see large oak, you'll see concrete, you'll see amphora, um, there's acacia barrels, so wide variety of things that you could find here. And of course in the aging process as well, you'll see quite a bit of, of French oak in Napa Valley, but there's also, let's say silver oak, which is one of the, the most famous wineries in all of Napa Valley, owns its own cooperage and they use American oak. Um, of course, you can see some uh, very protective handling uh, with just stainless steel. As I mentioned, sort of a, a variety of different options here for the winemakers. And ripened grapes here um, can be harvested by hand or by machine. Again, we don't have laws um, around that. Many, much of the winemaking here or the picking is done by hand. And a lot of that goes back to where we are. So if you remember what I mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of different hillside vineyards here. And some of them are just so steep that it would be absolutely impossible um, to, to do anything other than hand harvest. But it is an option and you'll, so you'll see both mechanical and harvesting. Um, generally here, we press the fruit very gently. Of course, if we're talking white wine, you're gonna press the juice off of its skins. And then with red grapes, of course, they're fermented on their skins to maximize the tannin, the color, the flavor development, and then pressed off of their skins later. Okay, so when we talk about the top white wines from Napa Valley, we're really talking Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. No, that does not mean that there aren't other grape varieties here. There's Riesling, there's Gewürztraminer, um, there's Muscat, there's Semillon. You'll find all these, there's uh, grapes uh, indigenous to Italy here. We've got a, a lot of Ribola Gialla. Um, so, but the top two, of course, are going to be Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. And these are both what I call international varieties. So these are not varieties that are indigenous to Napa Valley. I know we have people joining from all over the world. So, and these grow in basically every wine growing region. But what might you expect from white wine flavors in the glass? So of course, this is gonna depend on the climate, right? Because the cooler the climate, higher the acidity, you might have more tart kind of citrus flavors. Um, if it's a little bit warmer, you can head into sort of more orchard fruits, um, you know, peach, nectarine, apple, 
Um, some of this is going to come just from the, the great variety itself. Um, but then, of course, and if you move into even um, riper uh, fruit or warmer places of growing, you're going to get sometimes tropical fruit. And then as the slide shows some like this little grass here, we can have a little grassy herbalness, particularly on something like Sauvignon Blanc that we'll talk through in a moment. And then depending on how the winemaker decides to, to uh, ferment it and age it, you might get notes from oak or malolactic fermentation or something like lead stirring. So Sauvignon Blanc, uh, the wild grape. Um, so this is a grape known for um, a very vibrant acidity. It's not a shy grape. Um, it was always one when I was um, blind tasting to study for the master of wine exam. It was almost like a gift if I got this in a blind tasting because it's very expressive. Uh, it's very aromatic. Um, and of course, it's hailing from the Loire Valley of France, but it's grown around the world. As I mentioned here, Chile, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, name it. Um, but the grape itself, Sauvignon, is from the French word of sauvage or savage, uh, meaning wild, because the shape of its leaves is actually similar to those of wild grapevines. Not named that as you might think because of those sort of expressive aromas, but actually because of the shape uh, of the vines. And it's actually one of the parental grapes of Cabernet Sauvignon along with Cabernet Franc. So uh, there's an interesting history here of Sauvignon Blanc in Napa Valley. So of course, as you can see on the slide in the 1880s, Nibon planted it at Inglenook. Uh, it's that place I mentioned earlier uh, in the presentation. Um, and as with most grapes in Napa Valley, you know, Sauvignon Blanc has a long story, storied past uh, in the 1880s that Gustave Nibon was among the first to plant it. But other wineries began to plant it as well. And by 1915, uh, Beaulieu Vineyards and several others had won gold medal awards for their Sauvignon Blanc at a wine festival in San Francisco. Then in the mid 1900s. Sauvignon Blanc was pioneered by legendary vintners such as H.W. Crab, Trefethen, and Larkmead, although at that, con at that time they were calling it Sautern. Uh, and it was fashionable for California wines to use terms from some of the great wines in France. So you may remember that inexpensive California wines were sometimes called Chablis or Burgundy. Of course, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> but similarly, Sauvignon Blanc was often refer referred to as Sautern during this period. But fortunately, around 1965, around respect, uh, out of respect for these great wines uh, regions in, in Europe, this trend started to change. And American wines are almost always now named for their variety, uh, what's in the bottle itself. So we had a period here in the United States called Prohibition. And this is when it was actually uh, illegal to make wine except for medicinal or sacramental purposes. And it had quite a big lasting effect on the wine industry here. And in regards to Sauvignon Blanc, so prohibition was repealed in 1933. The Sauvignon Blanc plantings at that time actually exceeded Chardonnay in California, but we'll talk about Chardonnay a little bit later and you'll see that that has reversed uh, in the interim. So Sauvignon Blanc in the United States, it continues to gain popularity. Um, it's the third best-selling white wine in the US and here in Napa Valley, it's the second, but gaining on Chardonnay very quickly. And it's also the second most widely planted grape with 3,000 acres, about half the size of Chardonnay's acreage. Something um, that we coined here is this Fumé Blanc. So this is actually Robert Mondavi. Um, so at that time, uh, many of the Sauvignon Blancs that you would find were actually sometimes had a little bit of sweetness to them and they generally didn't have oak. And so this Fumé Blanc was a uh, proprietary name that Robert Mondavi called his dry Sauvignon Blanc that he aged in oak. So Fumé meaning smoked, so smoked white. And to this day, it's still quite a famous style and you will definitely see this at Robert Mondavi Winery if you visit. So Sauvignon Blanc is a great variety. I mentioned earlier, it's very expressive. It really speaks to you right out of the gate. So it's very aromatic body, on this slide, it's medium. It can vary a little bit. It can be lighter bodied, uh, but generally kind of right down the middle. And then, as I mentioned, very high in acidity. It has sort of a jagged acidity that when I taste it, it's almost like this instant mouth wateringness that happens. Very, very refreshing. And in terms of flavors, again, it's gonna depend on where it grows and how long it ripens, but you can get a variety of styles from Napa Valley from 
very much like what you might find in the Loire Valley, sort of citrus and grass to that kind of ripe uh, apple and pear, and then all the way into tropical fruits. And some people, as I mentioned, beginning with Robert Mondavi, um, actually uh, age their wine in oak. So just to talk a little bit more about vessels. Um, so there are two vessels uh, in particular that we often see in winemaking that are what we call neutral, and those will be um, uh, concrete and stainless steel. So really what you're gonna find is you're gonna get a very pure expression of the variety in your glass without any other influences from, from oak. But some of course will choose to use oak. This can add complexity. It can add texture. Barrels can actually breathe a little bit um, through, you know, through, the, um, through the wood itself. So it can also add what I kind of call a breadth of palette. And can just, sometimes if it's, let's say um, not new oak, you might not detect any oak aromas or flavors in the glass, but you can oftentimes actually feel it on the palate. So if you're talking to a consumer, if they like a wine that's very intense, has intense aromas, if they like acidity, if they like very crisp styles of wine, this is for them. And again, it can range from unoaked to oaked. Um, so if you know anyone who likes that, those types of wines, uh, definitely they'd like Sauvignon Blanc. And also I like it as um, it's very, because of the acidity, it's a great food pairing with other high acid foods. So things like goat cheese, or of course the Loire Valley with Sancerre and goat cheese is quite famous, but you can do this with Sauvignon Blanc from Napa Valley as well. And other high acid things like a vinaigrette um, or certainly anything with tomatoes. So I do see some questions popping up, so I'll try to get to those as much as I can, but let's move on to Chardonnay. So Chardonnay, um, so Chardonnay is the offspring of Pinot Noir and now what's almost extinct, which is called Gouet Blanc. Uh, but these were both widespread in the Northeast France in the Middle Ages. So the earliest known reference to Chardonnay is was written by monks in the year 1330. And because of its famous Pinot parent, it was once misidentified as white Pinot. But Chardonnay name actually traces back to its heritage in the Middle Ages and a small village of the same name in France, Maconnet region in Southern Burgundy. So again, this is a, a variety that I would call international, meaning it grows many, many different places. Um, but its particular history in Napa Valley is, is this. So it found its way to the new world in the late 19th century. And it's hard to track the first plantings in California because it was, as I mentioned, confused uh, with Pinot Blanc, Milan and other great varieties. Uh, but in fact, Pinot Blanc was the cause of Chardonnay being called Pinot Chardonnay in California up until a few decades ago. But we know for certain that in 1882, a man by the name of Charles Latmore, as you'll see on the slide, he was a president of the California State Viticultural Commission, and he imported Chardonnay Budwood, Budwood from Merceau in Burgundy, and then he distributed it uh, in California. It later appeared in H.W. Crabb, another very famous uh, and influential person here in terms of Napa Valley history, in his nursery lists as white Pinot Chaudonnet, whatever that means. <laughs> they were still figuring it out. But around the same time, Ingle Nook had a great variety. They were still referring to as white Pinot Noir. But Westwood's Budwood provided this sort of integral component of the Wente clone and the plant material that became the main Chardonnay plantings around the state. To go back to prohibition, as I mentioned uh, earlier, this time in history where um, it was very difficult to make wine, um, when it ended in 1933, there was almost no Chardonnay left in California. Um, it, one of the reasons was it didn't travel very well. So you could get around these laws of prohibition if you did home winemaking, but it didn't travel well because of this sort of thinner skin. Um, but as I mentioned, it's now the number one planting here in Napa Valley. And someone that I definitely want to mention is a family called the McCrays. Um, they planted Chardonnay on Spring Mountain. There's a very famous uh, winery that still exists called Stony Hill and really showcases some of the best Chardonnay, I think, in Napa Valley and can also showcase that Chardonnay can age. So a little bit more history on this. There was um, this uh, Judgment of Paris in 1976, where, of course, wine from from California was blind tasted against some of the great wines from around Europe. And lo and behold, some of, some of these wines from California actually you know, beat these French wines. It's a sort of upstart California region. And there's a winery called Chateau Montalena. And of course this 
became very famous because it actually won uh, at that tasting. And this in turn really just sort of skyrocketed Chardonnay's um, acreage planting in the United States and of course its popularity as well. So what might you expect in the glass? So it's not as aromatic as something like a Sauvignon Blanc. So mostly the aromatics come from uh, the winemaking. It's sort of known as the winemaker's grape because it's a beautiful blank canvas. Now that doesn't mean you won't find any fruit character in it, of course, um, but generally a little bit more neutral than other varieties. In body, you can range, um, here it says it's on the closer to the full, but of course we know Chablis can be very light bodied, let's say in a cooler region. And acidity is about medium. Again, it can change depending on where it's grown. If you're gonna have a much more sort of linear citrus note to it, or you can start to get riper flavors like peach and mango all the way up to very, very tropical if it's grown in warm areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about winemaking with this, but as you can see in the slide, Chardonnay very often, not always, but very often um, is either fermented or aged in some version of oak, which you can definitely detect in the glass when that happens. So um, as with other varieties, again, you'll see a range, but um, there is often a, a thing that happens called malolactic fermentation, or you can see on this slide, you can just call it MLF for short, but it's actually a misnomer. Um, it's not a from another fermentation, it's a conversion of malic acid into lactic acid. Um, and this is much more understood these days. So a winemaker can um, inhibit it or encourage it, but it can happen just naturally, of course. But what happens is the malic acid in a grape, which is that sort of tart kind of acid that you would find in let's say a green apple is converted by lactic acid bacteria into lactic acid, which is much softer. That's like the acid in milk. So it gets a softer edge to the texture of it as well. And then often, um, either fermented and or aged in oak. And again, because it is sort of this blank canvas or this winemaker's grape, you can also very easily taste a Chardonnay and know what the winemaker has done. Even if you haven't read about it, uh, what they did or have a knowledge, you can often just sort of detect it in the glass. And I will say um, there's often, there's a, a real return here in Napa Valley to a much more balanced, fresh style. You will find very sort of famous examples from Napa Valley of rich, oaky, buttery, um, which are very delicious to many people, but often now you'll see that winemakers are kind of scaling that back. And as it matures, some things that you might notice is it can pick up a sort of nuttiness to it and more dried fruit notes to it. Um, some hay, sometimes honey, and sometimes ginger. And as I mentioned, you will find beautiful examples like Stony Hill of Chardonnay from Napa that does uh, age very beautifully over time. So if you're talking to a consumer uh, who hasn't had Napa Valley Chardonnay, some things that you might describe uh, and suggest are if they like a rich body, sort of silky white wine, it has a different texture to the acid. As I mentioned with Sauvignon Blanc, I get this kind of jagged acidity. Chardonnay can have a much sort of softer, rounded acidity. Often you'll get sort of red apple, um, but you'll get a range. But then again, if they like wines with oak, um, it's definitely something that you could, that you could recommend. And just a quick little side note here, let's not forget that we also make sparkling wines in Napa Valley. Uh, and so of course you will find Chardonnay planted here. Uh, we have a lot of uh, traditional method here in Napa Valley and it's often blended uh, with Pinot Noir as well, which we will discuss. So moving on, let's, we have four red wines to get through. So I wanna be sure we're, we're staying on time. So we're gonna look at Pinot Noir, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Zinfandel. Things you might find in a red wine, often cherry, strawberry, blueberry, uh, black currant, plum, uh, blackberry. And of course, if the winemaker chooses um, to utilize something like, like new oak in particular, you might get things like baking spices, vanilla, clove, or a toastiness, depending on how uh, intensely the barrel itself was toasted on the inside. Chardonnay, uh, excuse me, Pinot Noir. So the heartbreak grape, well, why is it named that? So it's very fussy. This is not a grape variety that makes it easy for the growers. It can be very finicky and very difficult to grow. Um, so it's possibly the oldest, oldest 
cultivated Vitis vinifera species. Um, it's first mentioned with this current spelling is in 1375, but its true origins are, are still unknown. But by the 14th century, it was known by several names, including Pinot uh, in different growing regions in France. And today it's known as that heartbreak grape by many growers in California because it's very delicate. It's very delicate in both the, vine the vineyard and the winery. In the vineyard, it's a thinner skinned variety. So it's very easily affected by adverse weather conditions. It's susceptible to diseases, fungus, rot. And in the winery itself, it requires a very gentle handling to extract maximum color from its thin skins while still retaining the aromatics and flavors. So a little history of its rise in Napa. Um, so there's controversy as to exactly how it made its way uh, to California, but it's associated with some very famous names here. Um, Augustin Hazarathi of Buena Vista, Charles Lefranc of Alamedin Vineyards and Frenchman Pierre Pellier. So not, we don't know everything, but what we do know is that in 1880, uh, Pinot Noir was introduced at the California Agricultural Experiment Station and began appearing as early as 1885 at Gustav Niebaum's Inglenook Vineyards, as well as other Napa Valley vineyards. And then in 1902, when George de la Tour began producing wine, he initially choose, chose some lower end wines to make, but changed his mind. And in 1907, he planted 15 acres of Pinot Noir along with Cabernet Sauvignon. And then Louis Martini, another name you might know, he bought 200 acres of the Stanley Ranch in Carneros, which is a Southern Moor appellation here. And then in 1946, and again in 1947, Andre Telechev, another very, very famous influential person here in Napa Valley, produced two gorgeous vintages of Pinot Noir uh, for Beaulieu Vineyards that became sort of a benchmark of the California style. So today it's one of the best, um, it's the second best selling wine in the US and the third most widely planted within Napa Valley. And to put that in perspective, Cabernet Sauvignon acreage, which we'll talk about Cabernet a little later, is eight times higher than Pinot Noir. So clones, what is a clone? A clone is an identical copy of a preferred vine. So this happens as a natural mutation uh, and it can create variances. You'll hear about clones discussed often with Chardonnay as well, but definitely important to Pinot Noir. Um, so it can change the, the mutations can vary in the yield size, the berry size, the color. And sometimes and really often these variances are desired and become so new, so unique that a new name is given to it. So um, Pinot Noir is very famous for mutating and making clonal selection very important so that the winemaker has exactly what he, he or she wants in the glass. So let's talk about what you might find. Um, as I mentioned, it's a thinner skin variety. So in color, usually if I had a glass in front of me, if I tipped it over its, over its side, I could probably see through it. I could probably read words on a paper underneath the glass. Uh, in body, it tends to be just about medium. And similarly in tannin, it's, it's usually just around medium. Again, can vary a little bit, but it doesn't have that really thick skinned um, dominant tannin that you might find in something like a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Merlot. So on the, on the cooler side, you can find some very sort of tart cherry some vegetal notes to it as uh, ripening happens and sugar accumulation, you'll get more of these berry fruits that I listed here, you know, strawberry, raspberry, red cherry, sometimes cranberry. Um, and in too warm of a climate, it can get kind of excessively jammy and lose its freshness. Um, so generally you'll see here in Napa Valley, it's grown in cooler sites. So I mentioned Carneros, which is an Appalachian on the southern end, it's quite close to the um, proximity to the San Pablo Bay. So it gets a lot of fog down there. And it's also because it's a cooler site, Carneros grows a lot of fruit for our sparkling wine production here. And it not always happens, but often you will see Pinot Noir um, fermented and or aged in some type of oak. So Pinot Noir, as I mentioned, it's kind of the sweet spot here uh, for growing it. Uh, it's influenced by the bay, by the proximity to the ocean, and that kind of mitigates uh, the temperature here. So as I mentioned earlier, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this slide because we talk about it with the other grape varieties, but you can see a wide variety of handling in the, in the winery itself. You'll see stainless steel, 
you might see these large oak fermenters, you might see it fermented in small casks. So um, it's very common to have oak aging uh, with Pinot Noir and it's very, very rarely blended with other varieties. Um, I think that's probably common worldwide, but I can definitely speak to Napa Valley. I can't think of a single, other than in a, let's say a sparkling wine, you know, I can't think of Pinot Noir being blended with, with anything else. Um, so something about uh, Pinot Noir that we do want to discuss in terms of winemaking, because it's different than what you'll often find in other red varieties, is that a lot of producers or some producers will opt for whole berry fermentation. Uh, it can be carbonic maceration or a percentage of both. And fermenting with the whole clusters and on, this, on the stems themselves, it actually can give sort of a lifted perfume note to the wine. It can also add some tannin and some structure. And because it's a thinner skinned grape variety, it doesn't offer up the intense color of a thicker skinned grape like Cabernet Sauvignon. And so the winemaker will have to work hard to gently extract as much color from the skins as possible, but without being too harsh, of course. So it's often fermented in what we call open top fermenters. And this is used for ease of punch down. So punch down is when they're gonna push the cap back down into the fermenting wine to break it up. And of course, to, um, to increase that extraction from the skins itself. And in terms of maturity, um, you often find very savory notes as, as they mature, earthy notes. Game, I think, is a great descriptor for what you might find in an older Pinot Noir. Um, and then, of course, it's sort of mushroomy or sometimes a truffle note uh, as Pinot matures. So for a customer, um, if they like a softer tannin wine, so um, sort of more silky texture to the tannins, certainly Pinot Noir is a great option for them. This sort of red fruited note, I always get a lot of cherry, you know, strawberry on, on Pinot Noir, particularly from Napa Valley. It does have a brightness of acidity. And as I mentioned, very often it is matured in oak. So if they like a lighter bodied, silky tannin red wine with brightness and sometimes some oak, they will definitely love uh, Pinot Noir from Napa Valley. And again, just a reminder, it's not all still wine here. We also grow a lot of Pinot Noir for our uh, traditional method, sparkling wines. Again, very often grown in Carneros for these sparkling wines made here and often blended with Chardonnay as well. Okay, so moving right along, Merlot, um, so known as the Blackbird. So Merlot can be traced back to the first century in France. Uh, the name comes from the French word Merle, which means blackbird. If you're a French speaker out there, please forgive my pronunciation. Um, but it is an offspring of Cabernet Franc uh, and an obscure unnamed variety. It's also a half sibling of Cabernet Sauvignon as well as Carmier and Malbec. And it's often compared to Cabernet Sauvignon. But Merlot in the vineyard is usually an earlier budding variety and is easier to ripen than Cabernet Sauvignon. And it's a very fertile grape. So it can thrive in poor soils, moist or cold for Cabernet Sauvignon due to its high sugar levels, it achieves a little bit more alcohol percentage as well. And so tannins on Merlot, I often find very velvety, very soft, um, firmer than the Pinot Noir I mentioned, but often not as much as what you might find in a Cabernet Sauvignon. So let's talk about its history just a little bit. Um, so in the late, um, in the mid 1800s, it was brought here to Santa Clara Valley. And then in the late 1970s, as these varietal wines gained popularity, uh, several producers made moves to concentrate on Merlot in, in Napa Valley, which was then very dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon, including, um, but some that invested in Merlot are Duckhorn, who of course has a very, very famous Merlot uh, and a vineyard called Three Palms, which is very iconic, um, Rutherford Hill, and Swanson. And in the 1980s, uh, Merlot plantings were on the rise in Napa Valley. And then there was a very large crop in 1986. This brought down prices of a lot of varieties and profits for Merlot along with Cabernet Sauvignon soared instead because Merlot was the Valley's most profitable variety per acre at that time. And today it's the third most popular red wine in the United States and the second most planted in Napa Valley. Um, it is a Bordeaux variety. So when we talk about Bordeaux varieties, there are five major, um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, and then of course, Malbec. 
and what might you find in the glass. So it's definitely it's definitely going to have more color, let's say, than that Pinot Noir that we discussed, more body and more tannin. Uh, but these tannins, as I described, I often find to be very silky, very velvety is a good word to describe it. And then in terms of flavors, um, it can have that sort of vegetal note that I mentioned if it's grown in a cooler site. Moving into the sort of dark plum cherry and herbs, and then can take on this almost chocolatey mocha note uh, with a lot of ripeness. Um, but for me, when I was blind tasting, I always looked for this sort of plum note of Merlot, which was often a marker for me. And it is very often matured in oak. So it, you can find 100% uh, varietal Merlot in Napa Valley, but it's really very, very commonly blended like it is in Bordeaux here in Napa Valley with other, uh, with other Bordeaux varieties. And in the blend, it can add this sort of softness, lushness, um, where if it's blended, let's say with Cabernet Sauvignon, the Cabernet contributes more structure, acidity, and often a darker fruited note. So if you talk to a consumer about Merlot, um, something, some words you might use to describe it or suggest it is if they like wines that have a sort of rich body texture, that velvety texture, sort of a deep intensity. Uh, and again, plum is always a good descriptor for me, but you can find this sort of red and black cherry fruits, um, often with oak notes to it uh, in terms of vanilla, toast, other baking spices. Um, so if they like those things, um, and maybe they don't like a wine that's quite as tannic as a Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Merlot, is, Merlot is a great, great option. So this is a very important moment here in this presentation because Cabernet Sauvignon is really like the king of Napa Valley. Um, so it, it got its name from the fact that its wood and leaves resemble those of Sauvignon Blanc, um, which was later revealed to be one of its parents. So it's a natural cross between Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. And it is the most planted and most important and most expensive variety in the Napa Valley and is really truly the lifeblood of winemaking, of tourism, and of our economy here. Um, so again, I live right here in Napa Valley and I can tell you when I talk to people who come here from around the world, what they expect and want to taste when they come to Napa is Cabernet Sauvignon. So its homeland, of course, is in Bordeaux and it's grown in many warm regions. It's another international variety. Um, so here, of course, in Napa Valley, but also in Sonoma and elsewhere in California, Paso Robles and the Central Valley. And of course, internationally, Chile, Australia, Argentina, South Africa, many, many, many places. So in the late 1800s, there were several famous people. Some of these names might start to sound familiar, Niebaum, Crab. Um, that's when it was it was introduced, and then in the 1900, it won uh, gold at an exposition in Paris. And then I mentioned prohibition a couple times here, but of course, coming out of prohibition, the winemaking industry here was really struggling. Not a lot of wineries were still were still in production, but it did start to recover. And you'll really see in the 1960s and 1970s, this is when the legacy of Cabernet Sauvignon happened in Napa Valley. And following Prohibition, there were only, uh, there were less than 100 acres uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon. And now, as I mentioned, it's the top. So Cabernet Sauvignon, in terms of where it likes to grow here, I mentioned we have a lot of diversity of, of soil types here. Um, so it's a perfect match to this grape because it grows particularly well on our hillsides here but it can also grow well on the, what we call the benchlands and the valley floor. And you will find different styles in your glass uh, based on where it grows. So um, the mountain fruit, as I mentioned, tends to have a little bit more coolness, acidity, structure. The valley floor can have a little bit more ripeness and lushness, and there's often blended too. So you can find wines from a particular AVA in Napa Valley, like you might see Oakville, which is a very famous, Appalachian or Rutherford or Howell Mountain, but you'll also just see Napa Valley, so uh, Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, which can be blended from many different appellations. And that can also provide um, some, some diversity and complexity as well. So now we're really talking, we're on the higher scale here, of course. It's very deeply pigmented in color. If I had a glass in front of me, I likely would not be able to see through it and see that there are words on a page underneath the glass. It tends to be fuller bodied. And of course, in terms of tannin, what it's really known for here and around the world is that kind of great structure. So when it's underripe, 
it can have this sort of vegetal bell pepper um, as it gets a little bit more ripe over um, ripening time and more sugar accumulation, you get this sort of black currant, which is something I very often use as a descriptor of Cabernet Sauvignon, black currant, black cherry. And then of course it can even develop into this sort of very ripe fruit, blackberry and cassis. Um, and again, another variety that is very, very commonly aged in oak. So you will see both single variety Cabernet Sauvignons from Napa Valley, and you'll also see them blended into, into Bordeaux blends or proprietary red blends as, as they're sometimes called here, but almost always, always aged in oak. As they mature, you'll find these sort of leathery notes, earthy, forest floor, you can get more savoriness, and again, this sort of dried fruit note. And if you're talking to a consumer, so this is where you can really recommend something that has a lot of boldness to it. So, you know, deep in color, firm in tannins, fuller bodied, those sort of blackberry notes that I mentioned, blackberry, black currant, I find very prevalent. And often, as I mentioned, oak. So if they like the sort of toasty oak, um, it's a perfect recommendation. And Cabernet Sauvignon, because it has a great acidity and structure, can age very well. Um, Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignons, we're not always known for having long uh, maturity in bottle, but I can tell you for sure that that, that has changed and you will find beautiful, beautiful mature um, Napa Valley Cabernets that have just gained intense complexity over time. So now we're going to talk about Zinfandel. So Zinfandel is uh, often referred to as the native grape of California. We kind of embraced it here, but that's not actually 100% accurate. So it's been in California for a very, very long time, but its origins were very elusive until recently. But Dr. Carol Meredith, who makes a beautiful wine here called Lagier Meredith, um, she's a professor at the University of California at Davis, at UC Davis, and uh, is a very highly respected researcher. And so they actually went on, she and Mike Gergich, who's another famous gentleman here, they went on what they called a Zin quest to kind of figure out where this came from. So we found that the DNA, through DNA profiling, that um, it's been in Croatia, it's been found in Italy, um, and so it came over here, we don't know how, <laughs> but it made its way in 1850 to Napa Valley. Um, and it's with its popularity in uh, exploding of Cabernet Sauvignon in the 1980s, though, growers often began pulling out vines because uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, again, consumers were asking for it. You could often demand a higher price per ton as a grower. So a lot of it was pulled out. But what you'll find now is there's a, a, a beautiful wines and a great reverence for what we call old vines in Findel. And you'll find these sort of heritage sites of of vines that are own rooted, they're often not trellised, and what they can do is over time, um, as the as the vines mature, they produce a little bit less fruit, but it's very complex. And you will often find it in what we call a field blend. So often when it was planted, it was mixed with other varieties, maybe Mourvedre, Carignan, uh, and they weren't perfectly planted into neat rows like you'll see uh, often in Napa Valley. They were kind of intermingled in the vineyard itself. And so this field blend is, is a wine that's picked from these all these different, um, different types of varieties. But of course, very often bottled as a single variety as well. So what you might expect is a sort of medium plus in color, in body, and in tannin. It's a very aromatic variety. For me, I always get kind of a lot of like boysenberry, blue fruit on it as well. Um, although you can have a mix here, it's a grape variety that doesn't ripen evenly always within the cluster. So sometimes you'll have a sort of more tart red high acid fruit and then warmer, lusher, jammier um, within the same cluster itself. Um, and very, very often aged in oak. You will see some wineries here using French oak, some using American, some using a variety of the two together, but very, very commonly um, blended, uh, or excuse me, matured in oak. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we can find them both in blends, particularly these old vine uh, field blends, but very, very often 100% variety, single variety as well. So for a consumer, something you might like is if they like very ripe wines, um, it, as I mentioned, it is kind of aromatic. There can often be this sort of jamminess to it, rich soft texture, a full body, um, very often oaked, but 
not as tannic as something like a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Merlot. So it can be this kind of middle ground. And of course, if you wanna have a conversation about California, because we kind of adopted this as our own native variety here, it's a wonderful way to introduce someone to a variety that they may not have had uh, from other wine regions in the world. So just a couple other mentions here of, of other varieties beyond these six that we discussed today are Cabernet Franc, of course, a Bordeaux variety. Um, thinner skinned, often blended with Cabernet Sauvignon here, but can add aromatics and softness to Cabernet Sauvignon uh, and can demand higher prices than some of the other varieties here grown in Napa Valley. And of course, Syrah or Shiraz, uh, if you're in Australia, um, also grown here, beautiful examples. Uh, Carol Meredith, who I mentioned earlier, the researcher, she makes a beautiful Syrah under Laje Meredith. Um, and it really can express terroir here. Uh, that's kind of gamey you notes, know, black olive, pepper, spice um, that I really love. And just my own personal um, recommendation is sometimes if someone is, uh, they love Cabernet Sauvignon, but want to get out of a rut or try something new, I really love introducing them to Syrah. So it's definitely something that you could, you could recommend. So again, honorable mention for Cabernet Franc, which can have a little bit of a peppery note, kind of a bell pepper, um, cherry black currant, but can get quite riper over time into sort of a licorice note. And then of course, Syrah or Shiraz. I love the Northern Rhone personally. So I drink a lot of, a lot of Syrah from both Napa Valley and Rhone, but here in Napa Valley, you can have a, a bit of herbaceousness if it's a cooler site, but then definitely warmer. You can get these savory notes, black fruits, chocolate, and often aged in oak as well. So just about, um, you know, Napa Valley, this comes from the Napa Valley Vintners, but what we're known here are for is a group of relentless pioneers and visionaries who persevered to create wines that would rival the world's best. Remember, we're such, we're, have much less growing history than many other regions, but if you look at the notoriety of Napa Valley on the world stage, we're definitely known for outstanding quality wine region. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have a very diverse terroir, um, which provides growing, uh, a diverse growing area, particularly to the Cabernet Sauvignon, but to all of those other varieties I mentioned as well. And world-class winemaking. So you'll find, of course, many Napa natives who've grown, grown up here, have made wine, maybe it's their family's winery, but you'll also find winemakers who've come from all over the world to make wine here, you know, from France, from Italy, from Australia. And it's also a community here that really loves to share knowledge. So really set by the great and legendary Robert Mondavi. Um, he, he provided this culture here that all ships rise with the tide, meaning we should share knowledge with each other in order to raise the overall quality of wines from the region. And I really find that you still see that today. People are very open. They wanna tell you what they're doing. They're, they're, they'll invite you into the winery and kind of make you welcome and, and understand what they're doing. So with that, um, that is the end of my, my presentation here. Uh, again, my name is Vanessa Conlin. Um, that's my email address if you'd like to reach out with any other questions. But we have just a few minutes here if, uh, if there's anything else we want to cover. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And, and thank you again to our corporate patron, Napa Valley Vintners, for putting this together. Um, we're very appreciative of your time and, and all the education you have to offer. So thank you. Um, I do see a few questions in our little chat box over here. So, um, or sorry, in our Q&A box. So I'll start from the very top and then move our way down. I know we have just about two minutes, so we'll try to get those quick. Okay. Um, the first one is what factors leads a winemaker to make wine of 100% Cabernet versus the usual Bordeaux mix of Cab Merlot, Petit Verdot? Is it just that you desire to do so or is there more to it? That's a great question. Um, yeah, a lot of it is just the desired style. Again, we, you know, we, we have a lot of freedom here. We're not obligated by law to do certain things with the blend or the aging. Um, so often someone was, wants to showcase that single variety or often case a single variety from a single vineyard. And in other cases, they want to showcase a, a more diverse. And it's kind of like um, neither is better nor worse. You, you might get a better, more clearer understanding of Cabernet Sauvignon when it's 100%. But then in a blend, you can also see how it can marry and play with other Bordeaux varieties in a very harmonious way. So it's really just up to the winemaker and the, the intended style. Awesome. 
And there sure are some great examples of that there. Um, awesome, the next one is, uh, so white grape is squeezed from the skin only, whereas red is squeezed both from the skin and inner grape. Can you please explain again uh, the white and red grapes and harvesting? So I guess just like- yes. Quick yeah, so so very high level is um, with white wines in general, white grape varieties are pressed off of their skins and only the juice is fermented. Now you will find you will find some skin fermented whites around the world. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, um, they're pressed off the skins and then only the juice is fermented. Whereas with red wines, you want to pick up the color, the tannin, a lot of this, the structure and the flavors come from the skins of red grapes. And so they'll be fermented on the skins and then pressed off, off later. And then of course there are other things like rosé where we could talk about even more uh, different types, but that's, that's a very high level um, summary. Awesome. So I know we're right at the top of the hour. I'll just go through one more. Um, sure. And then if y'all have any more questions, you know, I'm sure um, y'all can email uh, Vanessa or the Napa Valley Vintners email as it was listed there. Um, but is it true that in general, the vineyards in Napa Valley are pulled down every 20 to 25 years and replanted? So I would say yes, and though it depends. So yes, they're often, they, they often are replanted sometimes because um, older vines start producing less fruit and it might be a desired higher yield. Um, but you'll see less and less of that now, or you'll often see just individual vines replanted instead of the whole vineyard. Um, and then of course there are those exceptions that I mentioned like old vines, you know, which are very prized for being, you know, maybe a hundred plus years. And so they're certainly not going to get pulled out. So you'll, you'll see all of those things happening here in Napa Valley. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa, for your time. Um, thank you Pleasure. to who joined us live. Um, we are very appreciative for your time as well, as I know everyone's located in, in different spots around the world. Um, but again, uh, this was all presented by the Napa Valley Vintners Association. And if you are curious on learning more, there was a slide with all of their information. Um, but also if you are curious on learning a little bit more too around the world and not just Napa, uh, feel free to look at our website to see what uh, different um, qualifications we have readily available for you. So thank you all very much and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you.